Hello, everybody, and welcome to our inaugural uh, Digital Journal Club for uh, the Journal Chest um, by the American College of Chest Physicians. Uh, we're excited uh, to have um, leaders in the space of um, early detection of lung cancers and pulmonary nodules. Um, so I will introduce our discussants today and then the article that's, uh, that we have uh, planned for the Journal Club. Uh, joining us today are Dr. Doug Ehrenberg from the University of Michigan. He's a professor there. His interests lie in lung cancer detection and screening as well as tobacco cessation. I have Dr. Peter Mazzone, who is uh, at Cleveland. He's the program director for the Respiratory Institute there um, and uh, the lead author for this uh, uh, paper that we will be discussing today. Our um, liaisons um, from um, the subject area expert um, committee, Dr. Ann Gonzalez. She's the associate professor at McGill University and uh, is a translational researcher who um, works in lung cancer diagnosis and screening and uh, judicious, uh, thoughtful use of uh, interventional pulmonary techniques uh, in this uh, space. Uh, I'm joined by Dr. Divya Patel, who is the program director for the Sarkway program at the um, University of Florida, also an assistant professor there. She is the uh, section editor for social media um, at the journal with me. So uh, we'll both be hosting this uh, and moderating this webinar uh, today. So the um, article that we will be discussing today is the uh, recent chest expert panel report on management of lung nodules and lung cancer screening. Uh, keeping the COVID-19 pandemic in mind. Uh, and uh, Dr. <clears throat> Drs. Mazzone and Ehrenberg will be the authors from this article, who uh, from this uh, you know, consensus statement, uh, who will be telling us more um, about this publication. So welcome, everybody. Okay, so um, I'm going to uh, start um, with the first slide, um, and I want to go over the existing uh, I want to share the objectives just to basically review the guidelines in management uh, of solid and sub-solid nodules prior to COVID-19, understanding why this pandemic needed for um, an update on these recommendations. We'll learn about, um, we'll be discussing uh, three major groups or two major groups of patients, which are patients who uh, are getting screened uh, or are being prepared to getting screened and then are in the process of annual screening. And then we'll go into patients who are already diagnosed with lung nodules and then how to follow them, followed by management of stage one clinical lung cancer. Uh, we will divide this into recommendations in low, moderate, and high risk nodules. Um, and so that's how we will split this program today. Um, next slide, please. Briefly, um, before I continue on your uh, chat box, we have shared a link to this open access article uh, in the journal, if you guys don't mind pulling it up. What you will notice is that there are two tables. Um, uh, so uh, table one is basically current, which is pre-COVID-19 guidelines for evaluation of solid lung nodules across the four different societies, which is chest Fleischner criteria, or Fleischner Society, lung rads, and British Thoracic Society. Um, as we know, they're divided into management of evaluation of on lung nodules by size, which is less than six millimeters, six to eight millimeters, and more than eight millimeters. And under each category, you uh, we divide them into low risk and high risk um, by patient characteristics. Uh, in in table two, uh, which is also um, yeah, in the table two, uh, which is a continuation of recommendations from the four societies, but this pertains to ground class and partially solid or part solid nodules. Um, here, um, we do have a division by size, usually less than six millimeters and more than six millimeters. And then um, in lung rads uh, classification, uh, we do have for ground glass less than three centimeters and more than three centimeters division. Um, so I won't go into detail of each and every um, type of category or nodule. But as we go through this, uh, we will go, uh, we will discuss how guidelines of, uh, or how the expert panel is recommending uh, approaching these different situations uh, in a different manner in the era of COVID-19. All right, so let's get started then. We'll have our first, uh, next slide please. <clears throat> 
So the uh, expert consensus guideline uh, in, in brief uh, mentions that during the COVID-19 pandemic, it is appropriate to one, defer enrollment uh, into lung cancer screening uh, programs or modify the evaluation of uh, existing lung nodule um, patients that you would be following. And they, I do think this is important to be stressed and the panel stresses it as well, is that the local regional patient related factors uh, all should be considered and uh, the decision should be individualized, uh, which is true for medicine, but I think it's even more uh, pertinent here because um, lung nodules, as we know, there's always a concern for uh, you know progression to malignancy. So something to be uh, thought about uh, at the sort of delivery uh, point. Next slide, please. All right, so Divya, uh, I'll let you take it away and let the questioning begin. All right, thanks, Farron. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so our first question I'm gonna ask to Dr. Mazone. Uh, Dr. Mazone, what prompted this expert panel report? What was the motivation um, to publish this article? Well, we heard from some practicing physicians uh, across the country uh, that they were struggling. They had new demands uh, being pulled out of their outpatient clinics uh, to cover services, a lot of time going into planning for potential surges of COVID patients, worry about bringing patients into the hospital and imaging them that they might expose some of their patients to COVID. And, and so they uh, those concerns led us to get together and decide, well, how can we help guide everybody in, in this important area? How can we help guide people about how to manage their lung cancer screening programs uh, with the other risks and priorities that they were facing? And are there acceptable changes to how we manage lung nodules uh, when we consider you know, what's going on around us? So it was really hearing from practicing physicians that, that they were struggling with some of these decisions that prompted us to gather this group together to try to provide some uh, practical guidance. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mazzone. Um, Dr. Gonzalez, I'm gonna ask you, are, is, um, is this something that you are facing locally in, in, in your practice? Um, trying to f decide or figure out what to do uh, with patients in terms of your uh, lung cancer screening program? Um, yeah, um, so actually, you know, I'm based in Montreal. We've faced a pretty serious uh, COVID pandemic so far. So certainly our lung cancer screening program, which is still is in its infancy, but has been placed on hold for now in terms of any new patients being enrolled. And um, we've transitioned as have most uh, most of us to a lot of uh, phone calls and video visits and, and certainly in, in adapting the follow-up imaging um, um, in, in a process that's fairly similar to what's recommended here, I think, overall. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Dr. Arenberg, um, how were the recommendations uh, created for this expert panel? So uh, a lot of the credit for this, uh, for, for, for moving this along so quickly goes to the, uh, the project leaders, that, which included Peter, um, uh, as well as Michael Gould and Gerard Silvestri, all of whom are authors uh, on this uh, product. Um, you got to give them credit because they put together a series of recommendations, which they then subjected to the, the panel uh, for uh, a vote. Um, and I think they, you know, herding cats is hard under the best of circumstances, getting 24 of us on the same uh, two conference calls over a period of less than a week was nothing short of heroic. And I think part of it was uh, the authority that these three have in the field and the respect that they uh, command for their expertise. They were able to put together, I think, some preliminary recommendations which were then really subjected to, uh, if you will, the, the, uh, the forge of debate um, and I think they started from a standpoint, and they, I guess, you know, if I could put myself in their shoes, every decision we make in medicine is about considering the risks and benefits. And uh, I think what sort of uh, uh, ties this whole thread together of all these 12 recommendations, which ended up in the paper, is that this COVID epidemic has, uh, of necessity, introduced a new and very important aspect of risk uh, 
into uh, both doing something and doing nothing. And I think, you know, I, I give them credit for their very well considered um, approach to this. The, the typical decisions we make when uh, approaching patients with indeterminate pulmonary nodules are really encompassed in these 12 recommendations. And they did a very nice job of incorporating the nuance of a very uh, uh, frightening uh, uh, prospect of both infecting healthcare workers and infecting our patients unintentionally by, by doing what we normally do, which is, is managing pulmonary nodules. I think what this paper does is it, is it, is it takes a, I think they did a really nice job of incorporating this added element of risk and benefit into the decisions that we sometimes, we make so frequently that we take for granted. So the short answer is a lot of these recommendations were created uh, and then uh, uh, these three uh, leaders of the project incorporated the 24 of us as, as authors to get um, added uh, viewpoints uh, into, into the paper and to get it done quickly. And, and um, according to the paper, there were um, 17 pulmonologists, five radiologists, thoracic radiologists, and two thoracic surgeons. So it was a good mix of, mix of uh, specialties, it looks like. And there was a predefined threshold of 70% um, of panel members voting to agree or strongly agree to reach a consensus. That's how the 12 consensus statements were made, correct? I'll let Peter talk about that, but I think that's a pretty standard approach for, for this process, right, Peter? Yeah, that, that's correct. We had identified 12 scenarios and drafted a statement for each uh, that was modified based on the iterative feedback of the group, and then it was they were each voted on, and all 12 of them passed that 70% threshold um, uh, that we had predefined to say this is this is not just a statement we wrote, this can now be considered a consensus statement. Mm. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so we'll move on to the next question. Um, so what were the recommendations um, of the panel if a patient is referred for lung cancer screening or if they're, if they're due for a repeat uh, CT scan, Dr. Arnberg? So uh, we, we considered those a little separately. So for people who are being referred uh, uh, newly to lung cancer screening, we felt that the uh, added risk both to the patient, uh, to the healthcare professionals, to the, to the burn rate, if you will, of personal protective equipment, of bringing somebody in for screening, uh, when you considered the added risks of, of COVID exposure uh, was not worth uh, uh, initiating a screening process. Um, you know, the thing to keep in mind with screening, which I think often gets lost in the shuffle, is that it is something that we do to people who are asymptomatic. And that lack of symptoms, which should drive the, uh, the initial decision to screen um, in, in a high-risk individual, is also what I think gives one a uh, 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 permission, if you will, to, to very carefully consider the prospects of, of whether you're doing harm by bringing the patient in. There's always harm that we introduce into a population when we do lung cancer screening. And I think bringing them into a healthcare system that's burdened with uh, 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 patients potentially uh, from this pandemic added more risk to the process. And so we felt the best thing to do was essentially for programs that are located where there is a, a high community uh, activity with COVID, we felt the best thing to do was just shut that down. That I can uh, speak personally from, from our experience in Southeast Michigan. Uh, I know that our program uh, at the University of Michigan and my colleagues throughout Southeast Michigan at Beaumont Hospital and Henry Ford, I know for a fact that we all shut down our screening programs, really taking into account these principles involved, which is weighing the risks of doing something versus the risks of doing nothing. So we recommended that lung cancer screening be deferred, not, not uh, uh, completely eliminated, but deferred while there's active uh, local community spread of COVID-19. Is, um, is there any prior data on the effect of deferring lung uh, uh, screening for patients, lung cancer screening? Are there prior studies that sort of can give you, an, give, give you an idea of about what the impact of delaying screening could be, uh, Dr. Mazzone? Yeah, I, I don't think quite, quite specific to that question, but certainly there's information that can help, help you to understand the impact. 
And I think it's an important question because by no means did we um, want these recommendations to be interpreted as screening's not important or screening mm. doesn't save lives in and of itself. Um, we're, we're proponents of screening, but screening in a very safe way. So on average, uh, the average person who's being screened, who's eligible for screening, maybe about one out of a hundred of those individuals will be found to have a cancer, lung cancer at the time of their screening. And maybe uh, half of those will be early stage and potentially uh, curable, whereas if they, uh, if they were found later, they wouldn't have been. If the pandemic allows you to screen someone three months later, but not currently, the chance that that early stage cancer will have progressed to uh, a later stage or harder to cure cancer, we felt was fairly low. So you're already starting at 1% and the chances that you're gonna miss an opportunity to treat that if you enroll, treat that effectively, if you enroll someone a few months later um, would be small. Uh, we recognize the need to diagnose and treat cancer as quickly as possible under a normal situation. So again, we don't want to uh, minimize the importance of screening, but in this situation, um, the relatively low incidence and the relatively low chance of missing an opportunity to cure that person of their cancer influenced our, our, our votes here. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. If you, um, if you don't mind, I would add, you know, two things to that. One is that you, when you consider the people who are at high risk, you know, this is a, a population of course, who are generally heavy smokers, many of whom are going to have COPD. Um, and I, you know, we, part of the conversation around these uh, questions as we've debated them on the conference calls was, you know, what, what does that do to the risk of COVID? Uh, these are people who are truly at risk from significant morbidity and mortality from this virus. And we took that into account. And I think, you know, I would emphasize what Peter said that we, we clearly think that lung, all of us, I think on this call are involved in lung cancer screening programs. So we believe in it. But we keep in mind that, that, that if there's lives to be saved from lung cancer screening, that happens over a span of time that's going to be measured in years, mm -hmm. whereas we're talking about delaying this by a couple of months. And I think that, again, sort of formed the basis for the very strong support this recommendation had uh, amongst the, gr the group that were involved in it. Okay. Thank you. Um, we'll go to the next question. Um, so before we talk about the next question, just for people who may not be as familiar with lung cancer screening, um, I, I want to kind of lay the groundwork a little bit. Um, so the recommendations are de uh, depend on whether the patient has low, moderate, or high risk nodules. So the first question I want to ask uh, quickly, just to kind of lay the groundwork, is how should a person determine how how um, how is it determined whether a nodule is low risk, high risk, moderate risk? Um, Dr. Mazzone. Yeah, so I think that's a you know, very important concept. When you're evaluating someone with a nodule, the plan you set forth is usually based on how likely it is that that nodule is malignant. And then of course your patient's health and their own value set. Um, there are a lot of uh, ways to determine how likely it is that a nodule is malignant. For the very small nodules, so less than eight millimeters in size, their risk is very low. It depends on their size, 1%, 2% risk. Once they get to be bigger, then there are features of the patient and of the imaging of that nodule that guides you in assessing the probability that that nodule's malignant. So the older someone is, the more they've smoked, whether or not they have COPD, whether or not they have a family history of lung cancer, how big the nodule is, its location, uh, whether that nodule's been seen to grow, if the edges of the nodule are, are irregular or, or speculated. Uh, all of those factors enter into your assessment of the probability of malignancy. Now, an experienced uh, clinician who, who's managed lots of lung nodules may look at their patient and their imaging and make that assessment themselves. But there are also available some nodule risk calculators 
that incorporate those factors and can spit out a percent probability of malignancy. Ultimately, you then bucket those into three separate buckets, either a low risk bucket where you think that the probability is low enough that you're just gonna follow that nodule along with an interval determined by the size of the nodule. A high risk bucket where you think it's so likely that that nodule is malignant that you're willing to go straight to treatment, surgical resection if they're healthy and fit enough. And then the middle bucket in between where you're gonna do additional testing to really try to move yourself to one of those other buckets. And that might be PET imaging, it might be a non-surgical biopsy like a bronchoscopy or transthoracic needle biopsy. Those thresholds between the buckets vary depending on which guideline you read. And in practice, they vary based on the patient sitting in front of you. So somebody who's um, quite elderly and, and has a lot of comorbidities, you might use slightly different thresholds than you would for a healthier, younger person. We kind of use the average of what's out in the guidelines when we, we wrote these scenarios. So the lower threshold between just watch and do something is anywhere from 5 to 15% among the guidelines. And so we tended to leave that at about 10%. And the upper range is 65 to 70%, again, pre-COVID guidelines. And so we use those numbers as the upper threshold, but we recognize that in practice, we individualize those thresholds to our patients in a particular situation. Okay. Thank, um, thank you for reviewing that. I, it's a complex uh, concept and there's lots of uh, papers that talk about it and the specific uh, guidelines that are mentioned in the uh, article um, reference you to the guidelines. So if you want to learn more about how to determine whether a nodule is low, moderate, high risk, that, those would be good references. Um, in the chat, I just want to point out that Virin is um, adding links to um, probability of malignancy calculators. Um, there's there's quite a few of them, um, and, and I'm hoping Miran can add as many as he can find in there. <laughs> um, okay, so specifically in terms of low-risk nodules, if, if a patient has a low-risk nodule that's solid, um, what are the recommendations that the expert panel had um, for the, given the current pandemic? Uh, Dr. Arenberg, I'll ask you to talk about this. Sure. So we, uh, again, we took into account that, that low risk, which is the key phrase here. And, and if it truly is low risk, we felt that particularly where local spread is evident, uh, it was probably best both for the patient and the health system to, um, to delay that until such time as, uh, as it became safer. And we, I think we used the term three to six months, uh, I'd have to go back and look at our exact wording in this. But for someone who we felt had a, a, a nodule with a probability uh, of, of cancer that was that low, we felt that uh, uh, delaying things at least three to six months was acceptable. Um, and again, you know, I think that all of these, if you look at the recommendations, particularly in the fine print, all these recommendations take into account the regional variability in the activity in COVID. And I'll use as an example, perhaps something that might be relevant to our later conversation, but we, had, uh, we have had real good working relationship with folks on the west side of the state of Michigan in a health system there called Spectrum uh, that's located in Grand Rapids, where for a very long time, they had very little uh, activity in COVID. And we actually sent patients there who we thought needed more urgent interventions, uh, uh, staging of, of what looked to be locally advanced cancer, for instance. And, and our colleagues on the west side of the state have been wonderful and cooperative, and, and uh, hopefully they can keep uh, the COVID uh, on that side of the state from becoming a, a bigger problem. But if they do, then perhaps we'll be able to return the favor. But I think, you know, the taking into account the local activity is a recurring theme that you'll see through all these. And uh, I think it gives, uh, hopefully, the it gives uh, 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 readers of the uh, of the of the manuscript a little bit of leeway to um, to interpret this for their own uh, conditions. I, I just want to say one or two quick things too, Divi, if you don't mind. Here, I wanted to highlight that the slide that you're showing the the question is 
for surveillance of low risk nodules, the number one and number two are not actually the low risk nodules. Those are the intermediate and high risk nodules traditionally. Yes. So the low risk nodule scenarios would be the solid nodules that are less than eight millimeters, eight millimeters. in size um, and, um, and the part solid nodules that have a solid component that's less than six millimeters in size. Um, right. Pure ground glass nodules, not because they have a low risk of malignancy, but because they're indolent if they are malignant and therefore you have the freedom to wait a little bit longer and not impact the outcome of, of your patient. The other thing I, I just wanted to highlight that Doug's already said is we tried hard to choose words that didn't dictate what any one individual does for one patient, but gave them the freedom to make individual choices, both based on patient factors and their community factors. So most of the nodule uh, statements have the phrase that it is acceptable to delay surveillance for three to six months. Not that you have to do that. You know, if you're in a situation where uh, you're not hard hit and you have lots of um, manpower and PPE and all that sort of stuff, it, we, we're not suggesting that the standard guideline be changed. Yeah, Dr. Mazon, thank you for pointing out, yes, you're right, the, the part one and part two of this slide should go uh, to the high-risk nodule slide. And now that I'm looking at the next slide coming up, the low-risk nodule uh, subsections are actually on the other side under high-risk. So uh, I, I, pre I appreciate you pointing that out. Um, we will fix that before we send the slides out to um, all the participants. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Gonzalez here what her thoughts about um, the delay. And I, I just want to confirm Dr. Arnberg had mentioned a delay in about three to six months. That is, that is correct, Dr. Arnberg. The, the expert panel recommendation for low-risk nodule, nodules was delaying screening for three to six months. I wanted to get Dr. Gonzalez's input on this and, and see what she thinks. I think uh, overall for the, if we're going back to the low-risk nodules. I mean, and we can discuss the, the high risk ones afterward. So it seems like, uh, I don't know if we, I think it looks like we lost Dr. Gonzalez. Um, while we wait for her, we'll go on to the next slide where we talk about the high risk nodules. And again, I just want to point out one more time that um, these, these uh, point one, two, three, and four should go under the low risk uh, nodule slide. So we'll flip those before those slides are sent out. So um, Dr. Arnberg, do you wanna talk about the recommendations for intermediate to high risk nodules? Sure. So, so nodules that are greater than uh, or equal to eight millimeters in size, solid and then subsolid. Sure, so uh, typically these intermediate risk nodules are uh, you know, what Peter had alluded to earlier, which is that this is a situation where we often look to some test that will, I guess, if you will, segregate uh, that nodule somehow into a higher or lower risk. That typically is either a PET scan or biopsy, a certain non-surgical biopsy that would then guide you to the higher or lower risk uh, uh, situation. We, uh, again, on this situation, I think we all agreed that uh, in these intermediate probability nodules, it would be acceptable, I think. And again, I, I compliment the project directors for wording these very artfully, uh, acceptable being the word not, uh, not mandated to either delay this or, uh, uh, or put it off or choose a lower risk path uh, for how to evaluate these. And, um, you know, we, uh, again, the, the, if there was debate, this was where it's centered because these are people in, in whom you think the probability of cancer is a little bit higher. That increases the stakes. Um, and again, I would just emphasize that the introduction of the COVID virus uh, uh, possibility into this just changes your risk and benefit analysis and, and in a way that has to be, I think, thoughtfully considered. Uh, I can tell you two months ago uh, when we were much more overrun with, uh, with COVID patients in our hospital, I would have been very comfortable recommending doing nothing for a couple months for this patient. Whereas right now, knock on wood, things seem to be quieting down. We're, we're returning to more 
of what, what, what might be considered normal uh, approach to these patients where we would send a patient for a PET scan, but we weren't doing that two months ago. And I think that reflects um, kind of the general consensus of the group who put these recommendations together, which is it, it was okay to delay those evaluations by three months or so because of the added risk of, of uh, proceeding uh, at the time. Yeah, I think the uh, statement mentions three to six month delay uh, again. Dr. Mazzone, is there anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I, th I think in, in this group in particular, we kind of went back to that, uh, the concept of what's the threshold between just watching and doing something and between just doing something and going straight to treatment. And we thought that during these times, it would be fair to increase the threshold that you'd be comfortable just watching and waiting. So instead of a 10% probability or lower, we went up to 25% and said anybody who has a lung nodule with a probability of malignancy less than 25%, instead of doing a biopsy or PET scan, you can, you, it's acceptable to just monitor that nodule in another three to six months. Mm -hmm. okay. And on the upper end, instead of the 65 to 70 percent in going to surgery above that, we moved that all the way up to 85 percent, thinking, well, you really want to try to avoid a surgery in somebody with a benign nodule if the hospital's filled with COVID or the community's filled with COVID. So we increased that up to 85 percent and said, now, between 25 and 85 percent, you still need to evaluate. PET scan, non-surgical biopsy, but you spare some people that evaluation on the low end and mm -hmm. you avoid some potentially avoidable surgeries on the upper end. For the highest risk, the over 85%, we suggested you could go straight on to treatment. And we compared all of these to the guidelines, but we recognize people's practice may be a little different. For example, some individuals on the panel even said, even that high, we would still try to biopsy it if, if it was biopsyable. And our statement could, in that situation, be interpreted as, you know, avoid the extra procedure. You can send that person straight to treatment. That's kind of what the thought process was. And you can see that although the votes were over 70% agree or strongly agree for all of these, there were a few more dissenters for this more challenging group than there were for the low risk or the screening questions. What would be the benefit of biopsying them? I guess more targeted treatment. Um, but, if you, but if you were gonna just do empiric therapy, are, I mean, would you do that just sort of like, this probably is a non-small cell, so this is a sort of like empiric chemotherapy for, for people with non-small cells, something like that. I, I'm not sure in which situation are you referring to, Divya, in the, in the so, high-risk group or the... Yeah, in the high-risk group, the ones you were saying that are, you know, greater than 85% probability of malignancy, that the recommendations are just to go straight to, to therapy without biopsy. Right. Um, you know, with in the era of, like, very targeted therapies, like, what, um, how would you go about or are making those recommendations. Yeah, sure. So, so this is uh, referring to a sol single lung nodule, mm -hmm. not a person who has adenopathy or metastatic okay. disease. Sure. At least in this time, uh, targeted therapies, immunotherapies and that are reserved for your regionally or, or distantly advanced disease. So for what would sure. be a stage one lung cancer, um, the only reason to biopsy would be if you wanted to absolutely minimize the number of resections you do for benign lung nodules, even okay. beyond that, you know, 85% mark. Um, and some programs practice that way. Others stick to the guidelines, 65% or 70% and above. So um, overall here, I, th I think the group felt comfortable with the recommendation that over 85%, you can just... Sure go straight to treatment. I think there's even added nuance here. So if a, if a surgeon's on the call, you know, they would talk to about a nodule that's very peripheral versus one that's central where that mm -hmm. might impact the decision to biopsy because okay. I think a surgeon's going to try to avoid a diagnostic lobectomy for something that turns out to be benign, but a diagnostic wedge resection is much less consequential, if you will. So 
um, you know, you have to, we have to acknowledge that there's, and, and we, you know, we talked a little bit about this is that there, uh, you know, Peter alluded to it, there, there are surgeons with different thresholds for, for concern. And of course, what happens, I think, in the context of a pandemic is the concern for bringing somebody in for surgery for something that turned out to be benign, there's a higher premium on not doing that. And I think that's where you'd say, well, maybe we'll biopsy something that we might not have biopsied six or 12 months ago. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think it, that's a great, great, great point. And, and um, we wanted the scenarios to be practical enough without ending up with 40 scenarios. Um, <laughs> I mean, realistically, two nodules that have the exact same probability may be managed differently because one might be tucked in somewhere where you just can't get a real good non-surgical sure. biopsy and another might be very easy to biopsy or one patient may be, um, uh, have comorbidities the other doesn't or a value set that the other doesn't. So there, there is nuance to this and, and I think we try to explain that a bit in the discussion these are multidisciplinary decisions, patient values, and all that sort of um, stuff is very important. Okay. Just really quick, Divya, if you don't mind. I think um, the point that was raised by everybody in the guideline in the beginning is to keep the local factors, regional factors in mind. So as we know, a lot of states and regions are starting to open up. A lot of hospitals have developed rapid testing or have the capability to do that. You know, maybe that would be another thing, Dr. Mazon, Drs. Mazon and Ehrenberg, that would potentially impact the ability of the surgeon to sort of intervene, should that be, you know, a thought. So I think that's uh, another interesting um, thing that's probably developed since these uh, guidelines were conceptualized. Any thoughts on that? Uh, I, the one thing I can think of where that's absolutely relevant is, is as we gradually try to return to what might be a new normal, uh, I keep hearing that term new normal. And, and uh, you know, we are, for example, last week, our institution started doing certain bronchoscopies again, but we aren't doing pulmonary function tests. So mm -hmm. while we might be able to stage somebody with suspected lung cancer, our surgeons are relying on their own intuition as to someone's physiologic fitness, at least for the foreseeable future. We hope to start doing pulmonary function tests again uh, for situations where it's more important patients with asthma, patients who, who need this to make a surgical decision. So yeah, all sorts of locally relevant uh, issues are gonna be rolled into these decisions how do we deal with these indeterminate pulmonary nodules? And I think the principles I keep coming back to is how does the presence uh, of this risk for this disease affect the usual risk benefit decisions that we make? And it's it sort of forces you to break those decisions down into their most basic building blocks, which as a, a, a you know as an investigator, I think is interesting. It forces us to think in real uh, simple terms about how we do things we kind of take for granted decisions we make regularly uh, are now a little more complicated and even a lot more complicated. Yeah, I, I think you highlight that this is a very fluid situation. And at the time of writing, my own institution didn't have adequate COVID testing to be pre-testing every procedure, but now that's changed. And so the balance is impacted by that situation. So uh, you're right on. You have to really be up to date on what's going on in your, in your area, what your resources allow. Okay, so um, we'll move on um, to the next question. And I think we sort of addressed this already uh, with Dr. Arnberg and Dr. Mazone, what the recommendations for clinical stage one non-small cell, small cell cancer, lung cancer are. Uh, is there anything else, uh, either Dr. Mazone or Arnberg, you want to add to what's already been said about uh, what to do with the patients that you've diagnosed with stage one lung cancer? And as and then a follow up to that is, um, you know, the the statement doesn't make any um, recommendations about higher stage uh, lung cancers, and kind of want to hear from both of you on on why that is and and um, what to do for those patients. So the first part of that then for the stage one non-small cell cancers, now you, you have a cancer there. And, and so in general, our statement is gonna suggest you go ahead and treat that cancer. However, 
talk about it with the patient, talk about it in a multidisciplinary tumor board if available. And there are some situations that you might consider delaying if your area is particularly hard hit. So a cancer that's really quite small, less than a centimeter, or a part solid nodule that you have some serial imaging and it's grown fairly slowly and you know you have the liberty of waiting to a safer time. Um, a patient who's particularly uh, frail to begin with may influence your decisions. So we highlighted times you might consider delaying treatment, but uh, by all means, treatment should be kind of the go-to and, and the delay should be justified. We were a group of pulmonologists, thoracic imagers, you know, thoracic surgeons. So we didn't stray into the higher stage disease. Um, that I think is a little bit harder to debate the urgency of treatment and for stage two, three, four disease, I think the ground floor should be find a way to get that person treated in as safe a way as you can. Um, but that wasn't the charge of our, of our group. Awesome. So since we have some time left um, uh, before the webinar, I did have a few follow-up questions, but I wanted to give us, you know, opportunity to all the attendees who have, um, you know, listened in uh, to the expert panel speak. If you guys have any questions, please feel to type them in. And in the meanwhile, I can, um, I have a few uh, sort of minutiae to enter into. Uh, to keep things exciting, right? So one thing I wanted to ask you is, you know, different places could be following different guidelines, whether it's the lung rives, you know, model or whether it's the chest model or Fleischner's model. Do you think across the different, not models, I should say, guidelines, right? So across the four different guidelines for the nodules, do you, did you guys notice that there would be a big discrepancy? Or do you think broadly just thinking about low versus you know, high nodules is broadly good enough in terms of considering deferral? I, I like to think of the nodule guidelines, you know, from the different societies as having more in common than not. Um, there are, as you noted, the differences are kind of on the periphery. There is in Europe, uh, I think, a more advanced and more wide acceptance of volumetric assessment of nodule behavior. I think we're moving in that direction. Uh, one of our panelists uh, on this uh, journal article, uh, Dr. Kazaruni, my colleague in Michigan, has been part of the uh, uh, American College of Radiology and helped write lung rads. And lung rads is moving in the direction of incorporating or at least allowing the incorporation of volumetrics. Um, but I think they all sort of take the same approach, which is what's the risk of cancer? What's the risk of doing an invasive procedure on this nodule versus the risk of waiting on something that might be a, a cancer. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, for example, where the British Thoracic Society might uh, put a, a cutoff between low and high probability, if, if you ask someone from the British Thoracic Society, it'd probably be fairly similar. Uh, and I think that even within the U.S., the guidelines are probably going to change as they evolve to not so much proscribe specific numbers, but to uh, incorporate kind of ballpark estimates, low, low, intermediate, and high, I think is much more important than 5% or 15%, 65 or 85. And Peter is so good at in conveying the nuance on this. I'd love to hear what he has to say. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that fully. I think, you know, it, the differences between the guidelines highlight that the evidence base is not perfect. And that actually works a bit to our advantage that we do have some flexibility, you know, to move those thresholds and to um, adjust them based on patients' values and characteristics. So, uh, yeah, there are differences, but they're they're not large. The uh, audience is probably aware the one guideline, the the lung rads, is specific to lung cancer screening. It's not that the principles don't apply to incidentally discovered nodules, but particularly for the smaller nodules, you know, they're, they, they're able to um, de-emphasize those smaller nodules a bit because the patient is already supposed to be coming back in a year. Uh, 
for their annual screening. So they're going to have a scan in a year anyway. So uh, that's just one nuance between them that, that is a little bit different. Um, this is adding controversy to controversy. So I totally understand that this is not probably going to be an expert panel recommendation, but you know, some of the things that I struggle with uh, in my practice is, you know, those lung nodules that are right at the sort of border, right? They're exactly one centimeter in size. And, you know, you wonder, should I go with a PET scan? Should I just go ahead with a biopsy? You know, so there are those borderline nodules, right? Where you're already struggling. So in the times of a pandemic, you might be skewed to pushing more towards say a PET scan or an imaging based study. So I sometimes worry that are we going to now create this pool of patients where we have we would have ordinarily done a biopsy, but now we've kind of got a set of patients who are sitting in the limbo with more imaging than we would know what to do with, right? Is that something the panel considered as a, you know, the snowball risk down the road as we are experiencing with other things in COVID? Does that question, first of all, does that question make sense? I'm sorry, that took me a while to communicate. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, in maybe two separate ways to answer in, um, the delay that uh, patients are experiencing, either in starting up their screening or for their annual screen or in managing the low-risk nodule, it, those patients are going to come back to us. So we're going to need to find a way to get them in and catch up. And, and that's not necessarily going to be easy to implement, even if COVID disappeared tomorrow. So Absolutely, you, you're going to have to be creative in how you get these folks back in and, and we're all going to you know, work a little extra hard to make sure people get their follow-up and, and aren't lost to us. The other uh, aspect of the question, I think as, as I've gotten more and more experienced, I've been become more and more comfortable with follow-up imaging. Um, I, I think the risk of losing a whole lot of time or, or opportunity in a centimeter or smaller nodule is really quite low. And, uh, you know, the harms of biopsy or surgical resection are real. So I become a little more comfortable in watching, um, but discussing it quite completely with, with my patient. Now that's not your 25 millimeter spiculated nodule we're talking about. That's your small one where you, you do have the luxury of a bit of time to make the right decision. All right. So we actually have a few questions coming in now. Hey, um, um, Viren, can I interrupt you for just one second? I just wanted to point out, Dr. Gonzalez sent me a message that she is with us by audio. <laughs> so um, we can include her in the conversation too, if, if, um, if possible. That is fantastic. So Dr. Gonzalez, I actually have just the perfect question that Dr. Um, Mazon set you up for. So, um, Amrita, one of the attendees is asking, so if there's a vaccine developed, uh, which is effective and safe, you know, which would be the end of COVID, um, as Dr. Mazon was saying, do you anticipate the guidelines reverting back to pre-COVID-19? That's a good question. I, I think... Um they may and, and they may not. I think we might learn from having, in certain cases, a more conservative approach, and we might learn from having perhaps a slightly shifted our threshold for what is low malignancy and high malignancy, where to act, when to go directly to surgery. So I think our practice may be modified by this experience, perhaps. Got it. All right. So... This is for whoever, um, it, it, this is a very, I feel like tricky question. So I will let whoever wants to volunteer go for this, okay? So um, an anonymous attendee is asking, many of the surgeons I work with wanted bronchoscopy and biopsy for efficient surgery, which, you know, I, I know where that's coming from, right? Because I mean, we've all been there. This saves them time and need for examination of the airway and also reduces the time to get a frozen section result. Is this a consideration operatively? And I, I totally see where this is coming from. Yeah, I, I can't speak as a surgeon, but uh, you know, I, I spent a lot of time with our surgeons and I have bounced uh, back and forth a lot on, on do you do a preoperative biopsy on something that has a very high probability of cancer? And I've, uh, I've, I've really incorporated, hopefully incorporated the opinions of my thoracic surgery colleagues into this. 
uh, a diagnostic lobectomy is a very different operation than a therapeutic lobectomy if you know it's cancer. So if my surgeon says to me, this operation will be better if I know what I'm dealing with when I go in, I will almost always do bronchoscopy ahead of time or ACT guided biopsy to give them that uh, added uh, uh, confidence doing the operation. What has happened in the midst of the COVID epidemic is if I think they can get it with a CT guided biopsy, even though I know I might be able to get it with a bronchoscopy, I'll send them for a CT guided biopsy because that's not an aerosol generating procedure. Uh, so I think, you know, again, this is a, a really good point. The question uh, posed was specifically, you know, it, where, where I work, my surgeons work this way. Well, that's good. That means this is someone that talks to the thoracic surgery colleagues and understands their needs. And I would emphasize that that's something we should all do. Our patients are always better off when we talk to one another uh, as their doctors. And I would, I would include this very much in that, uh, uh, under that umbrella, which is that if you know your surgeons are better off not waiting for a frozen section in the OR, talk to the surgeon ahead of time, see what they prefer, and, and, and then find the safest way to provide the in information they need. Absolutely. I think that's fair, and I, I agree with you. I think this is great that we have good collaborative questions and clearly good collaborative practice. Um, this is a question which I, I think um, a lot of readers of these guidelines, uh, the, this consensus statement will have. Uh, and David Franco asks, you know, you know, while we are delaying screening and we are doing this, you know, keeping our sort of uh, protection in mind, do the panelists worry that de-emphasizing uh, screening at this time will result in loss of enthusiasm in the primary care community in the future? Uh, yes. Yeah. I worry that we, we uh, fought very hard for screening to become uh, standard of care and implemented broadly and and I think we saw some traction and and I'm nervous that you know this sort of a a delay even though necessary might lead to changes in in practice so we'll have to keep uh, you know keep fighting for that other aspects of the care of the screen patient I worry a little bit about as well you know we we were um, proud of the quality of the shared decision-making that happened with our patients, the relationships that were built by face-to-face -face, uh, visits prior to screening, and now we'll likely be transitioning to, you know, virtual visits and safer, um, from an exposure standpoint, ways to have those conversations. And I'm not quite sure that they'll have the, the same impact on value-based decisions that, that our face-to-face -face visits have. So, a lot of work to do to make sure that we don't lose momentum and that we continue to provide really high quality screening for our patients. Perfect. And I, I think I think a lot of this uh, for me uh, would be continuing to have an open line of, line of communication with our colleagues and stressing that we are not changing necessarily our practice is just, you know, including everybody's safety for now. Uh, and the original recommendations potentially will come back into play. Um, I think this will be the last question before we sort of summarize uh, this fantastic article is, the question is, you know, where do COVID-19 patients uh, fit in the screening criteria now who have obviously developed a ground glass opacity during the COVID-19 time? I've been asked this once, and I'd be curious what the other uh, folks on the line think about this. I, I feel maybe incorrectly, maybe I have too much confidence, but I feel like I can look at a scan and see the difference between an infectious ground glass opacity and a potentially neoplastic one. That being said, if a patient's symptomatic with ground glass lesions right now, we're going to treat them the same way as we would who did not have a ground glass lesion, which is to test them for COVID-19, isolate them if, if they're positive. Uh, and, and hopefully enroll them in a clinical trial uh, if you have one available. Um, you're certainly not going to approach a ground glass lesion as an urgent need for biopsy. I, I am uh, one who's always tooting the horn that we should be uh, pumping the brakes on how we approach patients with ground glass lesions. If they are neoplastic, they're indolent. Many of them, in, in fact, are. But uh, I would treat every ground glass lesion in a symptomatic patient as if it were COVID-19 until proven otherwise. And I would do this agnostic of the concern for cancer for the most part. 
Dr. Gonzalez, may I pull you in uh, for a perspective from uh, across the border? Yeah, again, I, having not been doing screening since the beginning of the, the pandemic, I don't think we've really faced uh, that particular problem that is being raised. Um, so I think I, I would agree completely with uh, what Dr. Arenberg said in terms of approach. I think there was a question that followed about testing for COVID before bronchoscopy, which is um, something we've considered, and if I can tackle that one, I'd say, you know, our, our issue here has been that our uh, turnover for the test was still, uh, it's gone down to 12 hours, but which is not practical to do the same day test, and in, in, in with the goal of limiting patient visits, we've adapted a practice of having a PET scan before doing a bronchoscopy for any suspicious nodule, since at minimum a staging PET would be required if someone's being considered for surgery, and also doing a symptom screen and contact screen for COVID, but we don't currently have a rapid enough test to test before doing a bronchoscopy. We hope that changes in the near future. Amazing. And this is definitely not coming in, not as an expert at all, but our institution, like I said, has, the, uh, has acquired rapid testing and that has allowed us to consider uh, intervening uh, more sort of with confidence and keeping more people uh, you know, safe um, as we have sort of progressed through this pandemic. All right, I wanna thank everybody. And before I let everybody go, I just wanted to summarize and please correct me if I'm wrong and I'm gonna do a broad summary. So clearly not going into the minutia here. So for low risk nodules, broadly speaking, right? Uh, we are, the, the guideline, the recommendation is that we can consider uh, deferring screening by about you know three to six months, up to six months. Uh, for higher risk nodules, which would be you know potentially nodules more than eight mm, where the risk of malignancy is starting to cross 65%, especially if it crosses 85%, to consider actually doing maybe some imaging-based sort of follow-up, maybe a PET scan or repeat CT and find a middle middle of the road kind of approach there, and then. In terms of the uh, stage one uh, non-small cell uh, lung cancer, to consider you know factors such as you know how much is the PET lighting up, what are the patient factors, operative factors, um, local factors, and then decide if uh, how important it is to intervene currently. And then finally, talking about enrolling new patients into lung cancer screening as well as for doing annual low-dose CTs for people who you've been screening, um, those should uh, definitely be considered for deferral right now uh, till the situation uh, clears itself some more. Um, is that a fair enough um, summary of all of your hard work? I'm gonna to defer to the senior author to answer that question. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, th I think the way you bucket it is, is nice. We're deferring screening until the situation allows. When you're planning surveillance for a low-risk nodule, you can delay that surveillance a bit, and you've moved your thresholds up. So you might watch a nodule up to 25% probability, evaluate it between 25 and 85, and straight to treatment for over 85. Well, Divya, thank you for... Um being such an amazing co-moderator. I look forward to bringing the Journal Club back uh, again for the next installment soon, which we will release on social media. When it's clarified, Dr. Mazzone, Dr. Ehrenberg, uh, and Dr. Gonzalez, thank you for lending your time and all this effort during uh, clearly stressful times. Wish you all uh, to stay safe and uh, have a good day. Thank, thank you. you, everyone. Thank Bye you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.